And uh, I would like now to invite to the stage Harry Ananostaras Adams, who is the Executive Chairman of Kefi Gold Cooper and Golden Copper PLC. Thank you for attending uh, my presentation. I, uh, the, I've gone a full circle. I was born in Africa and find myself uh, speaking to an Africa Down Under conference. Uh, in Australia, welcoming Africans. Um, I didn't really work in Africa until um, about a decade ago. And for the last 15 years, Kefi has been focusing on the Arabian Nubian Shield. And I've been hearing about it from this industry, from Australia for a long, long time and how it was only a matter of time before the Arabian Nubian Shield would be on the modern mining map, even though it goes back beyond the time of the pharaohs as being on the ancient mining map. So uh, I can't say it's been easy. It's taken a lot of uh, work, perseverance, patience, uh, but I do believe that uh, we're at the uh, turning point, if you like, and uh, some of my friends in West African mining call East Africa the next West Africa, for what that means to all of you. But I, I suppose what it means is that, you know, without being in any way critical uh, of anybody, some of the security issues in West Africa have just highlighted the need for diversification. And at the same time, some of the improvements in East Africa in terms of sovereign risk have highlighted the prospectivity is still sitting there unaddressed. So those of you from West Africa, where I'll actually be on Monday, um, beware, the competition is rearing up in East Africa and uh, it's unstoppable in my opinion. Now let me see if I can make this work. Okay. So since 2008, we've been focused on uh, two particular countries. We've had a little bit of a look around some of the others as well. But we've been focused on Saudi Arabia and Ethiopia in particular. And um, I'm cheating. If I talk about Saudi Arabia, it's not technically in Africa, but you'll just have to put up with me. Um, but the main story here is Ethiopia. And I, I would say since 2008, in those 15 or 16 years, half of our time in Saudi Arabia was a waste of time because the country shut down its permitting system whilst it reformed it, which took about seven or eight years. And then it came up again in a much better form and now it's a bit of a rush. So it's working, but it costs us time. But we used that time to build our database, our information. We did make some progress, we made some discoveries. So we didn't waste our time in particular, but it was very slow going and parts of it were really uh, a waste of time. And in Ethiopia, a country that I arrived in for the first time 10 years ago, uh, you know, a, a country difficult not to fall in love with, uh, for a number of reasons, which time doesn't permit to go into. Uh, I'd say five years since then has been a waste of time because the country radically and euphorically introduced democratic reform at a rate, with hindsight, you'd say it was not ready for. And majority rule unleashed tensions and conflicts that had been bottled up for a long time they overflowed, they created problems in the country, and now it's subsided, and now it's back in the top 10 growth countries of the world, where Ethiopia had been for 20 years. So watch, so to speak, because it's back on again. And probably in the long term, under a more stable, secure system, because it's majority ruled democracy uh, in reality. And that's, in my view, a more stable basis for future stability. 
So we have a, a, a sort of a classic West Australian style open pit followed by underground CIL project in Ethiopia. Shovel ready, we're going through the motions of closing the financing. And uh, I'll speak a bit about that in a moment. And we've made two discoveries in Saudi Arabia that are coming along behind. They're not as advanced as the project in Ethiopia. Um, 1.7 million ounces resource in Ethiopia, open. The last drill hole was 90 metres at three grams, still open at depth. A million ounce reserve, 2.1 gram open pit, free milling ore in a part of the country away from any border. Uh, no involvement of artisanal mining no sulphides, acid mine drainage issues. So it was a cherry-picked first mover project, so to speak, for the region, for us. The minister apologised he couldn't make it. We were going to be here together this week, but uh, the boss pointed him in another direction at the last minute for this week. Um, I would say that... Uh, the minister and the cabinet and ministers generally are the hardest working government leaders I've ever seen in my life. They're very driven to get Ethiopia back onto a solid development pathway again, where it had been, as I said, for 20 years. And the self-inflicted economic damage of the conflicts that I'm sure you saw in the media up till a couple of years ago uh, to do with the introduction of democratic reform and the failed attempted coup by a minority group. Uh, that push is, uh, is, is enormous today. Now, um, in terms of uh, where, we, where we sit, in a nutshell, because of the damage of those five lost years of upheaval in Ethiopia and the lost years that only came to an end in Saudi Arabia two years ago as well, and coincidentally both countries pivoted around the same time, both extremely pro-development, pro-mining now, as of about two years ago, and you can get on with it now. Um, be because of that, uh, if you like, a downturn up till two years ago, uh, our, our stock, uh, the market plummeted. We're now about 10% what the stock, what the market, uh, what do you call it, the share market price was before the crisis. Uh, so I suppose therein lies the opportunity if you believe that I'm, what I'm telling you that it's turned. And I think you only need to do a little bit of superficial homework to realise that it is turning or has turned. Uh, therein lies the opportunity the gold price at record highs, the country is extremely pro-development, the crisis behind them, the reforms behind them, and we're, if not first mover, early mover. Um, without skiting, uh, you're bragging, you know, the fact that we stayed there, we didn't declare force majeure, we persisted, we defended our people, our project through through come what may, and we stood our ground to develop this project, pulled our financing syndicate together to get it going now, uh, I think has won us some, some standing in the country. Uh, I've been appointed honorary consul to the European country that I have a home in. Um, so again, it's, I like to think it demonstrates our commitment, our tenacity, and our, the integrity of, with which we treat our relationships for the long term. So why Ethiopia now? Well, not only the pictures show the, you know, the exhilaration of introduction of majority rule. I remember the election, people lining up in the streets from midnight to vote the next day. They so loved the opportunity to a vote. I mean, it was, it was fantastic. Um, but as I say, the perhaps rush of blood, so to speak, of going a bit too fast, 
notwithstanding winning Nobel Peace Prizes and things like that for the leadership, it, with hindsight, just went too fast. And anyway, that was self-corrected as of a couple of years ago. And, and I can say that today, our, our country director, uh, about a mamo, is, uh, is out at the site with the local government leaders planning the resettlement of the community. Uh, we've been given a security tick, if you like, from the independent security people to get to this next stage now. A very quiet district, always had been, a quiet family district where our project is, uh, farming district rather, where our project is, but precautionary measures uh, taken to make sure we treat it with all the controls that one expects to ensure absolutely safe development going forward now. The other thing that's happened recently, um, which I'm just touching on these things on each slide, I won't dwell on each slide point by point. It's up on our website for you, know, for you to read at your leisure. But um, the country has pivoted also in terms of uh, private enterprise reform to open up the private sector. We were the first people to be granted exchange control exemption only last October. That was a precondition for our international project financing. However, as of, as of now, they've opened it up to the whole mining sector and um, uh, you know, the stock exchange is being launched in the next month or so. Uh, the uh, foreign banks are being invited in to invest into the local banking scene. Uh, a, a plethora of reforms to open up the private sector. It's uh, private sector growth is the, is the focus uh, for, for the next chapter for the country. Uh, and, uh, you know, when, when in my observation, when Ethiopia gets it together and is really focused, it really does happen. I think Ethiopian Airlines is one small example of that, a good airline which um, has been, you know, uh, a notable success in, in world aviation terms. And it's because uh, it really got behind it and it, and it got itself, uh, you know, clicking. And the mining space, that will happen too. We're the first, if you like, fully bankable project, all designed to IFC performance standards. Uh, but others are moving as well. Uh, the largest North American mining IPO in a decade uh, was another company active in the country called Allied Gold, and they've started uh, their construction activities uh, in Ethiopia. They raised a couple hundred million for Ethiopia last September in North America. Saudi Arabia, not such a tumultuous story, if you like, but in a regulatory sense it was, because the coal regulatory system for mining was broken open. And because it is a tightly run centralist government, uh, when, when, when the monarch says go, everyone goes. And you've probably all heard about a lot of uh, promotion and activity and a rush to Saudi Arabia by the mining industry. And it's true, uh, you know, but it's not going to happen overnight, obviously. It takes a long time to explore uh, and to complete feasibility studies. But the world has arrived and there's a, quite a strong uh, spillover, if you like, uh, into East Africa now. The Gulf and Saudi investors are effectively mandated now to deploy capital into East Africa as well. So for us, our regional presence, where we have a strong leading family office as our majority partner, and we're the technical partner in Saudi, and in Ethiopia, we're the majority partner with the government as our minority partner in Ethiopia, um, I like to think that those strong relationships and, as I say, the determination of the last uh, 15 years on the ground uh, has positioned us to be able to move forward uh, successfully now into development and production. Um, I asked our uh, security consultants at Constellus to give me the latest, uh, you know, colour coding risk map of Africa. 
you know, everyone, everyone bumps into a dozen people who consider themselves experts on everything in Africa when you come to a conference like this. Um, but I just asked Constellus to give me the latest risk rating map and they, they basically focused on the countries that they considered to be relevant in the gold industry. And, um, and you can see there where Ethiopia rates today, you know, in some years ago, before the reforms of 2018, it was uh, on, on the safer colour code, so to speak. Uh, safest colour code. It's now ranking medium with a whole bunch of others. Um, and I don't see anybody rating lower risk than medium there. Um, so, why does one go into frontier markets? Why does one leave Australia, such a stable, developed economy, to learn about the politics of the 54 African countries or some thereof? Why does one work so hard to develop cultural rela cross-cultural relationships to prove one's integrity instead of just going to work in one's own backyard where life is easier? Why do you do all that? And it's because Australians are a bunch of can-do people. We're a country of migrants more than anything else. And our fathers or grandfathers came here to develop a future for their families. And it's in our DNA that we're happy to go to other countries to develop a future for those families and a better future for our own families. It's in the Australian DNA. You won't stop Australians going to new frontiers trying to do the right thing and trying to develop opportunities for mutual benefit. So why is the Arabian Nubian Shield opportune? And I gave you two very simple examples that those of you in the audience who are non-geologists like me, I've just been surrounded by geologists all my working life, but I'm a non-geologist. So what are two simple stories or anecdotes. Well, in Saudi Arabia, in the photo on the left, a five kilometre long gossinous ridge with green stained rocks all through it, meaning copper, had been sitting there mapped by BRGM since the 1970s and no one had ever drilled it. Now, you know, you don't need to be a super highly educated PhD geologist to realise that somebody should drill it. And on the right, we turned up in Tulakapi, we were invited in by the shareholders of a pre previous company that was there, and they were frustrated. They wanted a new broom, so to speak, and we were invited to be a new broom of the Tulakapi project in Ethiopia. And they had done 120,000 metres of drilling and the ore body was only a couple of metres down. No one had ever opened it up to have a good taste of it. So we, we did another 10 or 20,000 metres of drilling to sort of uh, truthing, if you like, the results of old. But we opened it up. We did, I've uh, forgotten how many kilometres of trenching, just to open it up and have a good look at it and a taste of it. That's Africa. You know, Australia's got a thousand companies competing within the continent. And in Africa, there's a lot of low hanging fruit, so to speak. But um, it comes with the sovereign risk issues of new mining jurisdictions and, you know, countries that haven't really been prioritising what we need up until now in order to do our work. Mine is an expensive, high risk game. And all the capitals up front, I was once given a talk by 30 bankers in Ethiopia, very proudly describing the growth of their bank from there, and it went up to there of their total resources now, which they measured in their own financial way. And I said, that's fascinating. We're the opposite. Our resources are there and they'll go down over time. That's we invest all our money at the front and it has to be done properly right up front because then we deplete the resource, that we deplete the reserve. And, so, and, and that's why there's so much due diligence and care in relationship building and the social development side to make sure that all stakeholders buy in. I think social licence is by far the trickiest and the most 
uh, important factor in success, more than any technical bit, so to speak. That's some of us out at the site on the left a few weeks ago, um, what is turning out to be the final uh, security visit before we trigger the resettlement preparations. We also have about 350 households to resettle and uh, livelihood restoration, and um, that's the topic of today's workshops out there with the community leaders and local government agencies. And the, on, the, on the right there is a school that we've already built, so we're already out there demonstrating uh, what we mean. Uh, a bit busy this slide, but essentially it highlights point by point where we are in our financing and what comes next. The lead bank has, pardon me, issued full board credit approval, board ratified. The co-lending bank is progressing its work to uh, catch up now. Uh, the lead local investors have given board approval. They're refreshing it around the terms of the bank board approval. Um, and we're going into the final three or so months of, um, of final brick in the wall stuff. So I'm running around basically pulling together the final brick in the wall. Our, our uh, if you like, valuation and stock market terms is at the low end of the graph vis-a-vis -vis, um, vis -vis, uh, peer groups in this sector. Um, and as I said, um, you know, if, if, uh, if the country uh, performance continues the way it has started, and it, in my view, unstoppable, it won't take long for us to de-risk and go up that graph now. I won't go through all that now, but basically there's a lot of financing going on down in the subsidiaries rather than at the top. The stock markets, particularly the London A market, are particularly weak for the sector. Bit of an irony given where metal prices are, but that's the reality. So we've done 99% of our work down in the, in, the, in the subsidiaries and within the region, effectively to avoid having to rely on the stock market. And just in case you haven't got the message clearly enough, that's the famous Lassant curve that investors like to look at every now and then. And the blue arrow tells you where I reckon we are. So I think that with both countries having pivoted for the better for this sector and our company being so uh, propitiously positioned, uh, it's a classic to me. And perhaps only the second time in in my working life that the stars have aligned around a particular moment in time for us to perform. Um, I'll just close off with a couple of images. Uh, that's the uh, layout of the Tula Kapi project. The plant people are the Lycopodium group that um, uh, are based here in Perth. Um, they've, uh, built plants in 20 African countries, amongst other countries. Um, as I say, open pit, um, nothing really weird about it, free milling or the plant. Um, they, the long Gossanus ridge I was telling about is called Hawiya in Saudi. Uh, we've picked up a satellite, or we've discovered a satellite deposit not that far away from it. Hawiya at the moment is about two and a half million ounces gold equivalent to compare it with Tulukapi. Um, and uh, uh, you know, it's still growing. Both of them are open, so to speak, both Tulukapi and Hawiya. That's Hawiya in a, in a, um, a long section. Um, the dark bluish, open pitable, the light bluish following a depth for widths of between four, to four and eight metres, width um, almost vertical, uh, all body, so amenable to fairly straightforward underground mining. Um, I won't take you through the addenda, uh, we, time doesn't permit here, but I really appreciate your, your listening, and as I say, uh, East Africa is the new West Africa, so watch this space. Thank you.